Hi, uh, I think you might be muted. I'm, I'm not sure if you're speaking. I can't see the video, but I see the writing and I don't hear sound. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. I did mute it myself, forgot. Okay, so we are going to continue our topic on um, text clustering. And uh, so what we are going to, uh, to do today is look at a new text clustering. So before we talk about that, uh, let's look at what we did last time. So last time we looked at k-means, uh, which is a widely used clustering algorithm. And uh, so basically that works for any uh, collection of items. If you have a distance measure, then you can do k-means. So distance measure, of course, uh, measures how far apart two, dark, uh, two objects uh, will be. Uh, the opposite of distance measure is a similarity measure. So that we know, right? So distance measure is a symmetric, symmetrical, and uh, the opposite of that is uh, similarity, that which is also symmetrical. So, so you have two, so for distance measure means that you have two objects. I can compute the distance between these two objects. And for instance, if you have a vector representation for an object, then you can use Euclidean distance to measure the dist uh, Euclidean distance measure to measure how far apart these two objects is, uh, these two objects are, right? Then you can do k-means. So the things that for k-mean is that you have to preset a number of clusters you want to create. So what that means here is that you got to make a judgment at the beginning. Let's say that for this collection of items, I want to create two uh, clusters. I want to create three clusters. I want to create 10 clusters, right? So that K you need to set. Once that K is set, then you carry out the algorithm and that K remains the same. Uh, K, so that's what K means, right? So K means really means at the beginning, I'm going to pre, uh, create, I preset K, that's the number of clusters I want to create. And then I'm going to randomly select K points. So those will be my, uh, we call it centroid, K centroids. And then I'm going to measure the distance for each object in the collection with uh, each of these K centroids or K center points. And then I'm going to uh, assign an object to this, to one of the K center points if it has the minimum distance. So that is a one iteration. And then from that, so from the initial iteration, then you have K clusters. And then for each cluster, you compute a new centroid point. So which could be taking pairwise distance and uh, you can uh, find the average, right? So you can take the average and then you get a new centroid points and then you repeat this uh, for one more time. You do, you then you have a new clustering then for each cluster, you also create a new centroid point. So you keep on doing until this process converges, which means that after a while, then it's not going to change. Your cluster will remain the same. So the only drawback, as far as I can tell, is for k-means you got to find this k, which is you. If you don't have any insights about your data, you don't know how you're going to set that k. So the next clustering algorithm we're going to talk about is that you don't need to set that k. So that K will be determined during the computation. So which will be 
better than k-means. Of course, then it will be slightly more difficult, uh, more complex, but uh, it's better in the sense that you don't need a preset how many clusters you're going to create. And that is called affinity propagation algorithm and we call it AP. Okay, so similarity-based clustering uh, like k-means needs to preset a number of clusters and we don't want to do this then we need to come up with a new algorithm. So here's the algorithm. So we start from here. So we let C be the collection of objects. In our case, the collection of documents, we want to cluster documents. So each of these D, we just think, we will think of it as a document or we can think of it as a vector uh, because we can represent each document as a bag of words words with an implicit order of words. So that is a vector representation. Then uh, we, can, we can talk about uh, distance between two objects. Okay, so the distance here we're gonna use is uh, Euclidean distance, right? So this is just the, uh, the square of difference of each coordinate Right, so this is uh, for so this so x i k is uh, the k's coordinate of d i, and x j k is the k's coordinate of d j because we represent each of these d uh, each document as a vector. So that means that for any objects, if you can have a um, the vector representation, then you can carry out this affinity propagation. And if you don't have a vector representation, but you do have some kind of a similarity measure, you can still carry this out. So we're gonna talk about that uh, after we finish talking this um, uh, algorithm, okay? So that is the first thing. So we need a vector representation for measuring distance. And second, this is just sort of a, the, uh, one way that we can do to represent a document as a vector. So we use a bag of words notation since uh, we, for if we follow lexical graphic order, then we have an implicit order for words. So hence they have a vector representation. And then for each value, for each coordinate, for the value of each coordinate, you can either use word counts uh, or the better way is because we have a corpus. So we use DF, IDF value. So that would be a better way to do it. So. So from now on, we just simply assume that we have a vector representation. And then the first step for AP is to compute a similarity matrix. Okay, so this is a similarity matrix. So which, and so the value in this matrix is the, you, you first compute the distance and then the opposite of it will We'll, then we use the opposite, which means we take a negative sign to indicate its similarity, right? So this is, uh, uh, so one way to come up with a similarity matrix. Then if you use other similarity measure, if you use other similarity measure, then we simply just, uh, <clears throat> use that similarity measure. So right now, you can think of this part is a distance measure. You take the negative sign, that will be your uh, similarity measure. Sometimes we can also take uh, similarity measure as one over the distance. 
and then plus one because the distance may be zero. So you take a plus one. So that is another uh, similarity measure. But nevertheless, so this is uh, how AP is doing it. So, so uh, normally, of course, uh, you know that if you use Euclidean distance, you get a pick, put a square root here, but that really doesn't affect our computation, so we get rid of that square root. Okay, so this is uh, this is what we have, and then <clears throat> for the for the item with itself. Okay, so this is SII. So the similarity, of course, uh, uh, you can the similarity, of course, uh, it, it it's one if you think of. Uh, it's a value, but in this case, we just think of, we just use it as the minimum, the smallest value of Sij for all Ij. So in other words, if you look at this matrix, we are going to first look at each of the off diagonal. So this, so this is a diagonal. So it's an M by M. So off diagonal means all of these other values. So they are off diagonal. So we can compute the similarity of each off diagonal element. And then we take the smallest one and put it into the diagonal. So that's pre-processing. So that's what AP does. So this is a similarity measure. So to carry out AP algorithm, if you are not using this similarity measure, then this you have to work on how you're going to represent this similarity matrix. Okay, now, as before in k-means uh, algorithm, we preset k assemblers, okay? So those essential points, you can think of them as exemplars. So, but the number of that is fixed. And at the beginning, you just randomly choose examplers. Right here, we're gonna compute these assemblers and during the iteration, these assemblers will be, will be changed. So dynamically changed, but we don't know how many examplers we're gonna have. Okay, so that is the advantage of this algorithm. So again, the idea is to compute assemblers and merge documents with the same assembler into one cluster. And then you compute a new assembler during the next iteration and you merge documents until your process converges, which means that you're not gonna get new uh, clustering. Then you stop. Okay, so that's basically the idea. Now, how to carry out this idea? All right, so, <clears throat> so let's first look at the algorithm that we're gonna use as an example uh, to explain it. Uh, because uh, basically you just uh, compare, right? C compare uh, the distance between, or the similarities between each pair of objects. So then in this case, we're gonna use two in addition to the similarity matrix, we're gonna have two matrices. One is called responsibility matrix. Okay, so which means that uh, I'm gonna determine whether I have a sampler, so that is a responsible. And then another matrix is availability matrix, and we just look at how many, uh, which, assemblers are available to make, so which points are available to, for us to make it a, a uh, assembler, which is a, a, a responsibility matrix. So then this is a dynamic process. So of course uh, you, it looks uh, imitating by looking at this formula, but we can ex explain it by looking at them one at a time, and then we're gonna use an example to demonstrate this idea. Okay, so we're gonna uh, now focus on this algorithm. 
So we use capital R to represent uh, responsibility measures, capital A uh, to represent availability measures. So initially, both matrices are set to zero. So their initial value, R and A, they are all zero. And then we're going to uh, <clears throat> update these values. So first we look at uh, responsibility matrix. So which means that we're going to compute this for all i and k. So this is index. The responsibility of i and k is equal to the similarity. Okay, so this is, uh, so we, each i k we have a similarity value. Okay, so. And then, now you think of this, what, what this means. And then we subtract that to make, to make, a, to make uh, I responsible for K. Okay, so this is now, maybe we just look at this bullet first. So this bullet. So this quantifies how similar DK is to DI. So which means now well, my DI will be responsible for it. If they are similar, uh, similar enough, then we should merge this di and dk. So that's the idea. But then, of course, uh, they are similar enough means that you got to compare to other candidate dk prime. Right. So I want to merge i and k uh, over other k prime. Right. So di uh, di and dk over other dk prime. So that means that the, this will represent the responsibility of a DK towards DI, which then should increase as the availability, availability of some other DK, DK prime decreases. Now. So in other words, uh, if you have less candidates of other K prime, then K is more, is closer, right? So the, closer to DI, right? So, so basically that's what this means. Um, so you have that, so in other words, you have all the, you have many other choices, then the responsibility of DK will be increased. You have less choices, then it will be increased. So then we just keep updating these values. And ultimately we prefer positive responsibility. So we want this, to be positive. Now, at, at the beginning, this is a negative, okay? So we know this value is negative. And then, now you, you look at this max, so look at the second term. Now remember, uh, a negative value minus a negative value could be positive if this is bigger, right? So now we are going to look at Look for all other k prime. So in other words, for the fixed row, now this is i, so this is a fixed row. So let's say my k is here, then this will be k prime. You have many other k primes available. And I'm going to look for their similarity with i, right? So this is similarity with i, this is similarity with i. And then the maximum one, right, for all k prime, that is not equal to k. Because they are candidate, they could be similar to i, more similar to i over k, but we don't know what it is. So we will take, just take the maximum value of this k prime. And then add to its availability. Now at the beginning, availability is zero. So which means that at the first iteration, we just look at whatever that's bigger. And then we update this value by making x i k minus this maximum value of this. And it could become positive if the absolute value of SIK prime is larger than the absolute value of SIK. Now remember at the beginning, they're all negative. So that's how then we can, we can switch over. 
for this responsibility, right? So because that becomes positive. So we, we update that, we update this value. But then we put this new thing into RIK. Okay, so now hopefully you are beginning to get some idea of what we are doing. Okay, so, so again, what we are thinking here is that suppose now at the similarity matrix, I have this, but then I want to update my, um, for each of these K, I'm gonna update this responsibility. What I'm gonna look at is all the other K prime to look at the maximum values of all the other K prime. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I'm going to make this happen. So subtract that thing off this as IK. So that I hope eventually this one will become positive. So at the beginning availability is, um, is set to zero. Now next we're gonna update this availability. So now you look at this, when I is not equal to K, how I'm gonna set the availability. So the availability is, uh, so the value, if you look at this, the minimum value is, uh, so first of all, you look at R, K, K. Now at the beginning, we know this is a negative value. And then you look at this, the maximum of, now here, uh, you look at all the R value because we can compute this R value. And then I'm going to look for the maximum of zero and this R value. Okay, so which means that if R is negative, okay, then, uh, the maximum of zero and this negative value becomes zero because it's the maximum value. So if it's positive, then we'll take that positive value, okay? So that is for any other roles, okay? So availability means now I'm going to look at the current I, I'm going to look for, now this is a other role, whether I can get some column here K on this column K. So this is K, but look for all the other rows to see which row is uh, available for update. So basically that's for this part. For all the other row I prime, which is not I, which is not the current row and not the current column. So, which is not the, uh, not I, not K. Okay, so there's any other things that we are not look, has not relation with I, K. So any other I prime that is not I, not K. Then we're gonna look for those. Uh, so in other words, we are not looking at the diagonal K, K and uh, we, are, we are looking at different row I prime on this column K to see which other row is available, meaning which one has a bigger responsibility value, right? So this is look for the bigger responsibility value. So once we found it, then we're gonna add it to the diagonal of responsibility, which is added to RKK. Now, of course, this could be positive, could be negative. But then the value we are going to return is the minimum of zero and that. So if it's a negative, then we're gonna return that. If it's a positive, we are simply return it to zero. Okay. So, so that's uh, what this availability is doing. And then if I is equal to K, which means the diagonal, we are going to simply look for the maximum available responsibility, right? So this is a maximum 
of zero and this, so this is a positive. <coughs> if this is a positive, then we're gonna return it. Oops, looks like uh, my pan out of the out of power, so let me charge it a little bit. <coughs> So uh, again, uh, we're here. So if this is positive, we're gonna return this. If it's negative, it returns zero. So then this availability, IK, quantifies how well it would be uh, for, so this is for uh, DI to choose DK as is assembler. Right, so we have assembly means that we're going to merge the di with dk, and of course compare with all the other uh, documents. Okay, so compare with other documents preference for selecting dk as a sampler. So that is the. That's the algorithm. Now, continue on. If the diagonal after uh, one iteration is less than zero, that means that DK is more suitable to belong to another exemplar. So, which means that uh, this DK uh, should not belong to <coughs> DI. Uh, sorry rather than being the assembler itself. So in other words, we choose another assembler. And then AKK reflects accumulated evidence that DK is suitable to be an assembler, okay, based on positive responsibility of DK. Now, uh, at the beginning, uh, this is R and A may not be as intuitive as we as k means, but after that we're going to use an uh, example to go through this, right? So then you will have better idea. Now to finish this iteration or finish this algorithm, we are going to compute one more matrix, which we are we call it criterion matrix C. So which means now so far we have a similarity matrix to begin with. And then we have S and I'm sorry, we have R responsibility and availability matrix, which will be updated dynamically. And after that, we are going to add R and A. So we're gonna have another criterion, which means now we're going to sum up R and A. Okay, then, so that will be our criteria. So this is uh, sum them up. And we take the maximum for each I, for each row. Right, so you got all of these value. We pick the maximum one. That maximum one now becomes the assembler of the I, right? So among of these, whichever is the max, and that becomes the assembler of this row. So that column, right, you think of that column is this thing. Okay, so then we simply put documents with the same assembler into the same cluster. For instance, if I have another I prime, its assembler is the same as this, then di and di prime then will be merged together into one cluster. Okay, so then we repeat this, right? So uh, <clears throat> we repeat this until assemblers remain unchanged, which means that you're not gonna get new clustering when we start. So now let's uh, see an example so that we can get a better idea. Right. 
So this is a, this is a classic example that people tend to use when they explain AP. Uh, they're supposed to be from the original paper. So this is a PhD thesis. Um, this AP was in a PhD thesis done by someone about 10 years ago in, uh, I think, uh, at uh, Toronto, at University of Toronto, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> All right, so here's my input. Okay, suppose I have five objects. Okay, so this is D1, D2, D up to D5 are five objects or five documents. And then their representation happens to be five uh, dimensional vectors. Of course, this could be others, right? W1, W2 up to some other, other dimensions. This happen to be five. So th this input matrix happens to be five and five, but it doesn't have to be, right? So these five, this five and that five doesn't have to be the same. But after you finish up computation, it will be five by five because you have five objects, regardless how many dimensions of your vector representation is. Okay, but in this example, it happens to be five and five. Right? They don't, so this five doesn't have to be the same as this five. Okay, so this is uh, something I want to make sure. But when you do similarity measure, measure you compare with objects, so then of course you get five and five, regardless the dimension of its representation. Right? For instance, uh, if you think about 100 dimension, then it will be 100 thing here. But then, so let's say you got 100 thing. So after you do similarity measure, you, then you still get five and five because that's how many objects you have. All right, so that's what we do. So now we do a distance by using Euclidean distance, and then we take the negative. So that becomes our similarity matrix. Okay, so because we we use a negative similarity to represent its. Uh, well, actually negative distance. So let me just say the negative distance for similarity. So uh, basically that's what it means, okay? But some people just call it negative similarity. But I would say that it should be negative distance for similarity. So then that's the computation, okay? So now we can verify this. Let's say uh, off diagonal, let's say D1 and D2. So we look at this, D1 and D2. So this is uh, the distance D1 and D2 would be three minus four square plus four minus three square plus three minus five square plus two minus one square plus one minus one square. One minus one square, so that is equal to, so that's one, that's one, so this is a two, so it plus four, and that's one, and this is zero. So that is seven. You take the negative, the similarity will be one, two will be the negative distance D1, D2, which is minus seven. So that's how you're getting here. D1 and D2, you get minus seven. Uh, if we want to do so because they are symmet symmetrical, so D2 and D1 also minus seven. And if you want to carry out, let's say we carry out this, 
D5 and D1. So this is the same. So D1 and D5. So that will be one and five, right? Let's do one more calculation. So this is the distance one and five. So that's three minus one square plus four minus one square plus three minus three square plus two minus two square plus one minus three square. So this is four. And that's, so this is uh, four minus one is three. Three is nine, three squares are nine. So this is zero, zero. This is again, four. So that's 17. So you take the negative. So this is a negative then you get minus 17. So you compute for each off diagonal, you compute this, right? So you take, uh, say you have M objects and you do in the order of M square, com uh, order of M square, many computations, then you get, you fill all the off diagonal values. And then you take the smallest one. In this case, the smallest one is minus 22. That's the smallest. And then you use minus 22 to fill in the diagonal. So this minus 22 will go in each of these values. So that's how we compute this similarity matrix. Okay, so this is a negative distance. Okay, so that's, so that's what this is, is. So this is a similarity matrix. So once this is done, so this similarity matrix remains the same. So uh, no matter how many iterations you're gonna, you're gonna need, you're not changing is a similarity matrix. So what you change is responsibility matrix R and the availability matrix. Okay, so now remember the responsibility matrix is this. So for R I K, it's equal to S I K minus the maximum value of k, which is not equal to k prime. And then a i k. Okay. Let's put that. Okay, so uh, I, I'm sorry, i k primes. So, S I K prime. So basically you fix a row, right? So this is row I. And then you look for the other value, which is not the current K and see which one is larger and then you subtract that. Now let's, let's look at this one. Uh, we can do D11, right? So, so let's say we do D11. And uh, we know S11 is negative 22. Okay, so initially this is negative 22. And then we look for this row. Okay, so the largest one, now remember, at the first iteration, A is zero. So basically we just look at this. So the largest one is a minus six. So then negative 22 minus minus six, that is 16, uh, minus 16, sorry. All right, so it's equal to minus 22 plus six. So that's minus 16. So you get that value here. So likewise, you do this. D1 and D2, so D1 and D2, 
So R12 is S12, which is minus seven and minus the largest value of the other ones, which is uh, one, right? Because this one minus 16 minus six minus eleven, so this is the largest value. So which is minus one. And then this is equal to uh, the original is, let's see, where are we? We are looking at D1, D3, right? Sorry, we're looking at D1, three. So this is not one because it cannot be one. So this is minus one. So, so this is other than this itself is a minus one is the largest one. So that is, your, uh, so I circle that. So that means what we're going to do. So this is one three, one three minus, minus one. Okay, so one three is minus, Six. Uh, okay, so let me see. Why is that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The largest one, not from this R matrix, from the S matrix. Okay, the largest one here is minus seventeen, but not this updated value. So I'm looking at the wrong row. So this is a minus seven. Okay, so that is a minus six plus seven, that's one. So that's where we get this. Okay, so let's look for one more. Let's say we're gonna do this one. Uh, let's do a separate, a different role. Let's say D3, D2, right? So let's do this. Let me uh, erase. The other one, so that we don't confuse ourselves. Okay. So that's D3 and D2 we are gonna do. All right. So we're gonna do R3, two. Row is three. Uh, column is two. So that's equal to S three two from here. That's uh, the value we're gonna update is this. Okay, so that is minus 17 minus the maximum value of this row. Of this row. Okay, now remember A at this point is zero. So we are going to look at <clears throat> the largest one, which is minus six. Okay, so it's minus six. So the largest is here, not in this column, right? So minus six, so three, two is a seven minus 17 plus six. So that's minus 11. And that's what we are getting here. Okay, so now you get this idea. So what we are thinking is that we are going to update each of these value by finding, by using the largest value in that row. Okay, so we're gonna use that to update its current uh, value, right? So. Originally, this is a minus 17 after this update becomes bigger. So it becomes a minus 11 because we are subtracting a something, right? Subtracting something from a negative one. So that usually uh, will become uh, larger than 17. So that's what we get. So we do this for every other uh, element. So we get the responsibility matrix R. So next we're gonna update availability matrix. 
So there's the next one. Okay. Now remember, uh, we do availability matrix uh, by using different uh, formula. One is for diagonal, the other one is for off diagonal. So let's just do it uh, off diagonal. So remember, this a i k when i is not equal to k. So this is off diagonal, which is equal to the minimum of zero, and then the maximum of, so let's go back there. The, from this, uh, from the diagonal of the responsibility matrix. Okay, okay. So you look at the, you look at the column because we're now we're looking at a particular column and then we're going to look for the maximum of uh, zero for that column. So that means a different row on the same column. And then we're gonna sum them up for all i prime, which is not i, which is not k. All right, so that's uh, that's a i k. All right, so which means we have to remember what our r is. So that's our r. So let's pick a uh, pick a value. Let's say we do this off diagonal. So which means we are gonna compute A one, two. And that is equal to the minimum of zero. Oops. Hold on, my screen here screws up. Zero of summation. Now, this time we are going to look for this column. All the other values for this column. All the other value that's not one or two. So which means that we're going to look for this. Uh, from the previous one, so that's R. Back here. So we're gonna look for, so this is R, we're gonna look for one and two. So look for this, which is going to look for this. And then the maximum of zero and this, because all of these are negative, so the maximum value is zero. Okay, so then you add it to R two two. So that's R two two is minus fifteen. You add zero, so it's still minus fifteen. You take the minimum one, so that minimum of this and zero, so that's minus fifteen. That's what we have here. Okay, so that's minus 15. So then you compute all of these. And then uh, for each row, okay, after you finish compute, 
computing this, then for each row, you take the max, uh, sorry, for each, for, for each value, you do this criterion, so which is uh, A I K plus R I K. So here is 21, so one, one is 21. Now let's look for the R. That's a 16, so 21 plus, sorry, 21 minus 16, that's five. Okay, and then for this is, a is minus 15, R here is minus one. So that is, you add them up, it's minus 16, so you get that. So then you just update this. So this is a criterion matrix. Okay, so then for each row, after you finish this update, the largest value for each row, let's put a bold phase in there. That's our assembler. So, this largest value is five. This is five. This is five for this row, for these three rows. And for the next one, the largest is negative five, the negative five. So now that means after this iteration, I'm going to merge T1, T2, T3 into one cluster and merge D4 and D5 into another cluster. So now I have two clusters. Is this the final one? We don't know, but we can, we can do one more round of computation to see whether they remain unchanged. If they do remain unchanged, then we, get, we can stop. Otherwise, you keep on doing it until it converges. Now, at this point, you can sort of like uh, do an intuition to look for, to see whether they indeed make sense, right? So we can, Go back to our input. Okay. Now we know after this, this is a one cluster. This is a one cluster. You see that makes sense? Actually they do, right? Because this D4 and D5 really means that they, if you look at these values, so two, one, three, three, two, one, 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 three, two, three. So each of these is off by one, each coordinate. If you look for this, you also see that they are D1, D2, D3 seems to be larger than D4 and D5. Likewise here, this is D3. So these seem to be larger and also they are off by one. So intuit intuitively you, was, you would agree, okay, I hope you agree with me that D1, D2, D3 are in the uh, closer than D4 and D5 and D4 and D5 are closer than any of the D2, uh, D1, D2, D3. So that really makes sense by doing this merging. But of course we, it may not be the final clustering because we only carry out one iteration. So in order to determine whether this is the final thing, you have to uh, repeat the algorithm. So this time we are going to update. Now we, we, this time we have R, we have A, we have S, then we're gonna do R again we're going to A again, we're going to do C again to see whether we still get the same cluster. Cluster, if it is, we stop. Otherwise we update the clustering and repeat the algorithm. All right. So that is AP. So next. Uh, are, are there any questions before we move on to the next topic? All right, so now we're gonna look for, look at term clusterings. So earlier we uh, look at AP algorithm. So that's, that works. Uh, K-means and AP, they, they work for any documents as long as they have a distance measure. 
So uh, of course, uh, when we look at AP, we are, we you we did use a uh, example that closely uh, uh, <coughs> represents our interests by looking at documents. But uh, AP and K means can be used for any objects to cluster any objects as long as you have a distance measure. Um, which is a symmetrical distance measure, then it will apply. So now, after we look at these two uh, clustering, clustering algorithms, so assuming that we can use them to cluster uh, terms. So right now we are interested in uh, finding word associations, right? So we, we want to know which words would be should appear in the same group with the other words. So that means that we're going to cluster terms. So here, uh, terms and words are interchangeable. Sometimes, of course, uh, these words could be generated to phrases. So that's our understanding, right? So that means that uh, we are thinking about the basic units in text, which could be words. Sometimes it could just be phrases. So that's our understanding. So in this case, for instance, um, we want to associate words or terms. In this case, of course, if you see a word soccer and baseball, of course, they all represent sports. So that means that they should be put into one cluster. And evaluation and assessment should be in another cluster because they are talking about the same similar things, right? So evaluate, assess some things, right? So then, uh, so this is intuition. So then, of course, uh, we're going to uh, use uh, what we what we learned before to, uh, to cluster them. So then the things that we need to worry about here is how can we come up with a, a matrix, I'm sorry, the vector representation, or in other words, how can we come up with a similarity measure or distance measure? So one way to do this is to, do, to use language model. So this is how we, we need to carry out this computation first. All right, so uh, let's say I have, we want to compute a probability of a certain word when you observe an, a certain different word. For instance, this example says that I want to compute the probability of W when you see computer. And then for all the, terms or words appear. So this is how I get its value, right? So you think of um, a, uh, a back of words representation. As, as, as I said earlier, you can use, either use TF-IDF or in this case, we are thinking about, um, I want to find something that's can be sort of uh, the probability that when you observe something, right? So this is uh, from a different, slightly different point of view. Okay, so that's what we do. So that's what we come up with. Um, so computer itself, so uh, is a 0 0.004. That means a four times over 1,000 appearances. <clears throat> And software, uh, one times over 1,000 words, right? So this is four times over 1,000 words. And text is six times over 10,000. And of course, the ASDs, we know that they should have a higher probability because they don't really mean much. Okay, so these, the, so these are, if you look at TF-IDF, so they should, 
they should have a very small values. Okay, so on the second one, so <clears throat> for this corpus, this is a general background English text. So this is the documents contain word. Then you see here among one, two, three, four, five. So this is a 10,000, one in 10,000 words you see computer. And still the A is in V, they still high because these are common words. So this is a language model. This is how you do counting. Um, you do maximum likelihood estimate and you get this. And then you normalize it. Okay, so after you normalize it, uh, so this is a normalized topic, okay. I, so this is documents contain Compute the word computer. This is a general document. So you normalize it means that you divide this, uh, divide this probability from the general document. So this is what we get. So computer becomes 400, software 150, program 104, text three, and then these there A is V st still remain the, about the same. So it's not big. Okay, so which means that it really makes sense when you uh, do this. So these are common words, they are, they are after normalization because these are big, these are also big. So that means they just remain about the same. But these uh, computer actually becomes much bigger. So then of course, from here, you can do cluster. So the higher value should be placed into one cluster. Computer software program. So they, they are pretty big. So you set a threshold value. So they should be in one cluster. So this is sort of uh, uh, So this is a clustering method using uh, this language model. So that really means from that observation, we are using, uh, we are given, we are, we, are, we are providing a scores for each word. Okay, so, so we come up with a score. So this 400 is a score for computer, 150 score for software, right? So this is sort of a scoring approach. Uh, of course, we can also use the previous approach, which of course uh, we didn't give scores for each of these uh, objects. Here we give a score. So how do we do scoring? So we use the maximum likelihood estimate <coughs> of a unigram. And then of course we know that what you do is do counting. So this is a, uh, the count number of number of times this particular W appears in your documents and there's a total number of documents. And the score will be depending on your interest. So if we want to see under computer, right? So for all the words, I'm sorry, for the documents that contain computer that we do this scoring. So that's how we come end up with. So that becomes using maximum likelihood, it becomes this. So this is the uh, count, okay, in these document that contain, that contain computer. And this is the general count for this word in the whole corpus and divided by the number of documents in the whole corpus and the number of documents that contain computer. So that becomes your score for W and then <clears throat> words with high score are considered semantically related to computer. So that's what we saw earlier that computer software program, they have relatively high score. So they should put into one cluster with they are related to, in other words, they are related to computer because that's what we are looking at for this. So that is um, scoring methods.
And then, uh, so this is a general topic as before, if how do we handle unseen words? So if certain words is not seen in your uh, given text, but we still want to come up with a good estimate. For instance, this case, the artich artichoke, okay, so, so this looks like a Reggie, right? Appears only once in C, and it happens to be in D. Now it's just extreme case. A certain word, even though it appears only once, but it happens in a doc. It appears in a document with computer. Maybe when we talk about this veggie, uh, so maybe use computer to to do something about it. Whatever. So it appears, and then it looks like this score will be high because when you when you observe computer, but in reality, they are not supposed to be related. Okay. So then we need to fix it. To fix, to fix it, we are going to do the following tricks. So this is an interesting trick. So we pretend that we have observed an actual pseudo count of every word. So which means each word counted twice, including unseen words. So any, any word that you are not seeing, uh, then we are going to get this. So this is a, uh, the probability of W when you, for the underlying C, okay? So the unseen word, so W is counted twice, <clears throat> so what we're gonna get is, um, is this, okay? And then the score using plugging in our earlier formula, which is this, then you get, you get down to this. You get, you, you simplify, you get, and you get to this. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, one common way to handle unseen words or smoothing. Of course, you can, earlier when we look at text retrieval, we also look at DVH lay prior or JM interpolation for smoothing. We can also use those too. Uh, so this is approach for any um, when you use a language model to figure out its probability or scoring. So now we are going to uh, look at another measure, which is called point-wise mutual information, or PMI. So PMI treats word occurrences as random variables and quantifies the probability of their co-occurrence, okay, within some context of a window of words. So rather than just doing a straightforward counting of co-occurrences of words, you are going to uh, take an approach of language model. So for instance, let's say I have a window size of N, meaning I'm gonna look for a, uh, a consecutive, uh, well, a sequence of a consecutive N words. And then I'm going to say, let's WI appears in it in this, then I'm going to compute in this window, the information that WI and WJ, where WJ is in part of this, it's part of this context. So that I'm going to say is a pairwise mutual information. So in other words, this is a co-occurrence. So WI and WJ co-occur in this context, but how many, how much information it carries. 
which is measured by which is measured by this. Okay. So you look at the drawing probability of WI and WJ because they co-occur. So for instance, if you look, if you set n is equal to two, so that means that all the consecutive pairs, you're gonna compute this. And then this is individual probability, you think of a unigram. So this is a bigram, so this is a unigram. And uh, you take the log, so that is the uh, PMI information. So I'm, I'm not sure if this is correct though. Uh, so I need to check this, okay? I need to check that. But this is the definition. So for the, uh, you use the maximum likelihood estimate, is it equal to this, okay? Uh, we probably don't want to use maximum likelihood. Instead, we should use a smoothing technique to come up with this. Okay, so we are, you know, want to use this now. And then after this, you can normalize it. Okay, you uh, normalize PMI. So that means now I have a measure. The mutual information this two words appear in the same window how much information it carries so that is a uh, common common way to uh, measure co-occurrences okay so once we have this and now let's look at. <clears throat> N-gram class language models. Okay, so. <clears throat> so this is a generative model, which means that we're gonna, we're gonna compute, we're gonna compute the probability of certain word when you observe a few other words. So this generative, that means I'm going to compute a probability that a certain word appears. And this is derived from the likelihood function. In other words, it computes the probability that you will see certain word. All right, so my time is up, so I'm gonna stop here and we're going to continue this topic on Wednesday. Any question? All right, so see you Wednesday.